Well, hello everybody, this is Philip Shields. You know what? I don't know anybody who likes to surrender. No team, no army, no nation likes to ever surrender. But you and I have been called to surrender totally, absolutely, without condition, without condition to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, or as I use his Hebrew name, Yeshua, the Messiah, Christ means anointed, Messiah means anointed. And so that's what I'm talking about today. Have you and I, do we understand the importance of absolutely surrendering without condition to our Savior, to our Lord? Let's bow our heads just for a quick opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, holy, mighty God, God Almighty, God in the highest. And we come before you and your Son, who's at your right hand, who came and lived and died for us and was resurrected to live again in us, for us. And we come to you asking you to guide this, that your anointing will be on the not just the speaking, but the hearing, that you let the people listening to this to hear exactly what you individually and personally and specifically want each one to hear and think as we go through. We thank you so much for your high calling. We thank you for your call to surrender to you. And I hope that this will be made clear that you will inspire the words. Let me even get away from my notes if you're giving me your word at that moment. We praise you. We thank you. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> so nobody likes to surrender. In old days, when armies would surrender, when nations would surrender, it usually didn't end up very well for the one surrendering. They, the, the leaders were killed, crucified, martyred, beheaded tortured, not in that order, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. And so often the nation became a slave nation, literally a slaves, and they were put down. They were not treated well at all. In World War II, for example, I know you, you probably have heard of what we Americans call the Bataan Death March in Filipino, uh, in the Filipino language and in the Philippines, they don't say Bataan, they say Bataan. B-A-T-A-A-N. But if I say Bataan to you Filipinos, I'm saying it because so many Americans don't understand that it should be Bataan. Anyway, right after Joe MacArthur had to leave the Philippines uh, so that he could mount um, an army against the Japanese from Australia, starting from Australia, eventually landing on, in Leyte Island um, in, uh, in the Philippines. But before that, uh, the Japanese had won the victory over the Americans, and I think it was like 75,000 Americans and thousands of uh, Filipinos, I think, were either included in that or additional to that, had to go on this death march many, many miles in the heat, not given water and food like they should have, and those who weakened and fell or couldn't continue were often just bayoneted or shot. It was a terrible thing. In fact, our webmaster, Scott, in his... Uh, he said, I think he said his great uncle was actually on that very death march. My two uncles were in the Philippines fighting. My father was in the Philippines during World War II on a, on a, a medicine, uh, hospital ship. So anyway, but um, 75,000 people. And they treated the, their, 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 their prisoners very, very badly. The Japanese brutality was well known. And so, um, in fact, when we finally got to Okinawa, which is an island just south of the mainland Japan, uh, the Japanese put on such a uh, defense, in many cases it was suicide charges at the American machine guns, that they lost over 110,000 Japanese, plus another 150,000 civilians. Plus, we lost, I'm going to say lost, I don't mean casualties, I mean dead. I don't mean wounded, I mean dead, 12,000. And so Truman knew, President Truman knew, that if he was to get the Japanese to relinquish their homeland, we would probably lose about a million Americans because they would fight like crazy over there. And so he dropped two horrible bombs, the atomic bombs, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, they were dropped, and shortly after, a few days later, Japan surrendered. And they had to surrender without condition. They were willing to surrender with conditions before that, but not without conditions. Finally, they did. One of the reasons they uh, didn't want to surrender is because, like us, we give up 
rule of our own lives when we do. And so we don't like that and their honor. So they favored suicide. They'd rather die to the self and uh, not ever surrender. And it may have been also part of the fact that they were conditioned to say that you wait, if the Americans ever get us, they're going to have revenge on us and it's going to be brutal. And so they refused to surrender at first. Finally, though, after the atomic bombs, uh, the surrender was done on the USS Missouri. I've been on that ship. You can, at least when we saw it, it was in uh, Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Very historic ship. And if you're ever in Pearl Harbor in Oahu, I, I recommend you, you go on board and take the tour. The Imperial Armed Forces of Japan surrendered to General Douglas MacArthur. We're trying to put some pictures up to show these things as well. But after the surrender, nothing the Japanese thought might happen, the terrible revenge, uh, the enslavement, the torturing, none of that happened. In fact, laws were strictly passed that prohibited American uh, from, from doing anything like that to Japanese. They were welcomed back into the world community, although it took some years for the Asian countries around Japan to really trust that Japan was any different now. I know in the Philippines, they actually resented the money and the time that we Americans put into Japan as opposed into their, their own economy there in the Philippines. And the Filipinos were our friends, our allies, all during the war. Why am I giving this story? Because like it or not, at one time we fought God. You may not think of yourself as ever fighting God. The Bible says that we all have sinned and we all were considered part of the group called the ungodly, that God died, God sent his son to die the godly for the ungodly. And so, but before we could become a part of his family, we had to accept that death and we had to surrender completely, totally, without conditions, every aspect of our lives. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. You all kind of think you've surrendered. I will tell you, I've, I've repented deeply preparing for this sermon in all the areas I'm seeing that I haven't surrendered, even now, fully, completely, to my God and Lord, Jesus Christ. So I challenge you to listen to this. Romans 8, verse 5 and 6 says that God sent his son to die for the ungodly. But first we have to become a part of his family by surrendering to him and then receiving his nature, his spirit, giving up our own as much as we can. And we, although we'll have that until the resurrection, we'll have two natures inside of us, as I've often spoken about, Paul, Paul speaks about in Galatians 5. <clears throat> so welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of this site, and I dedicate it to Jesus Christ, to Yeshua, Hamashiach. Uh, that's the Hebrew of, uh, to, to Yeshua, our rock, and Yeshua, the Christ, who is also our light. And all of this is done for the Father's glory. Our site, remember, I'm going to be doing videos, but I also will be doing fresh audios. And we have a couple hundred, I think, sermons on here. All you have to do is go to the search bar, type in the topic you want to look up. There will probably be a sermon on it, on Holy Spirit. Now we're coming to Pentecost. Uh, it's right in the word Pentecost, Holy Spirit, and all of that, and things that you think relate to Pentecost, the first fruits, and so on. So we had to unconditionally surrender every aspect. I'm bringing this up because we all, I think, have, all of you listening to this, have accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as your Savior. But we have to go beyond that, continue to keep him and look at him as Savior, our Lord and Savior. Now we have to continue to look at him as our Lord, Master, King, Ruler, completely surrendered to him, absolutely. 100% to the Messiah, surrendered. So I preach to myself in this two-part series as well. It might end up being three. It's a very important topic, especially in these days of anarchy, especially in these times when no one wants to be told anything by anybody else. Be your own man. Set your own goals. No, God says, I want you to follow my goals for you, my will for you, my desires for you. So we have to trust him and surrender and say, yes, sir. Yes, Lord, or we don't surrender and we're on our own. Have you unconditionally surrendered? Have you taken up your cross daily, like we're told? 
and followed him to the place of being crucified with him? Have we put him first in our lives ahead of our husband, our wife, our parents, our children? Do we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of our Lord? 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5. Would we be willing to, have we, would we be able to say, as Peter did, Lord, we've forsaken, we've left everything to follow you. Luke 18, he says that. Would you be willing to have it said of you like it was said of the early Christian, Hebrew Christians, Paul says, or, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 34, for you joyfully, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Do we trust him on to, uh, that he really knows what's best for us and everything we're going through, even though we don't have fun at the time a trial's going through, that it's good for us? We trust him so much that we thank him in it. We thank him for it. Why is this an important topic? Because if you haven't totally unconditionally surrendered, fully surrendered to God Almighty, to Jesus Christ, to Yeshua, then we haven't gotten very far in our spiritual calling. We've started, we've taken him as our Savior, we, but, but now what? Now he calls us to surrender, now he calls us to obey, now he calls us to submit in every aspect. Now we have to accept Yeshua. Yeshua, that's the Hebrew, Hebrew for Jesus, remember, as our Lord, our Master, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, Captain of your salvation, Lion of Judah for you. He bought you, he paid for you, he now owns you and me. So now we have to learn the meaning of the Son of God becoming and being our Lord. We, we in America, we haven't grown up with the words Lord. You know, in England they have the House of Lords and they have the Parliament. Uh, and so the, the House of Lords are the nobility, the earls and the dukes and the people like that who are in there because of their title. And they call them Lord this and Lord that, Lord Mountbatten and, you know, so. Um, but we're not used to that. But in America, we're all equal, we think. There are elite in America, don't kid yourself. So anyway, we know scriptures refer to him as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Have you ever heard and listened to a Handel's Messiah concert? If I can, I'd like to even try to have that in the background, quietly in the background, so you can hear me as well over it. But I loved it whenever we would go to a Handel's Messiah concert, when they'd come to the Hallelujah Chorus. And at least the last time I saw it, some years ago, I hope they do it still today. The entire audience would stand in honor, respect, and worship of our Lord and Savior when they came to the Hallelujah Chorus to honor Jesus. And uh, it always moved me. And one, one time I was even part of a, a choir and from our college that joined with the Huddersfield Choral Society. And I thought that was so wonderful with these professional tenors and basses and alto sopranos around me. I was so moved, I just lip synced. I didn't know what lip syncing meant back then. But I didn't even want to hear my voice compared to theirs. So, you know, now my voice isn't good at all. I had something wrong with my vocal box. But anyway, back around 1972, 73, we had that wonderful concert. And there's coming a time after it seems the forces of evil are gaining control. And conservatives and believers in God are maybe even being jailed and, 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 and persecuted terribly. But there's coming a time when nations will assemble to fight him. And guess who's going to be with it? Let's read it. Revelation 17, 14. It says, And then these ten kings and the beast power, these will make war with the Lamb. Revelation 17, 14. And the Lamb will overcome them. Have you ever seen a fighting lamb? Have you ever seen an angry lamb? <laughs> this will be one time. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are the called, chosen, and faithful. Many are called, few are chosen. So those few who are chosen are there, and they're faithful to the very end as well. And then there's the heavenly supper in, in, in heaven, the marriage of the lamb. And then in Revelation 19.16, it says, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's listen now. Is he your Lord and Lords? Is he your master, your captain of your salvation? Let's listen now and watch the final minute of 
Handel's Messiah. This is performed by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I'm not a Mormon. I'm not supporting or backing them up, but they sing beautifully. But anyway, here it is, the final minute of the Hallelujah Chorus. heard now the final minute to the hallelujah chorus king of kings lord of lords he shall reign forever and ever hallelujah messiah hallelujah god almighty our father god most high thank you praise you praise you praise you praise you we worship if we could i'd fall down on my ground right now to worship you and praise you for everything you are and everything you're offering us now, the Greek word Lord in the New Testament is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, K-U-R-I-O-S. And it's translated Lord, owner, master, husband, and controller. The Lord was uh, someone who covenanted back in the old days, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. They covenanted to protect and fight for and provide for the ones that they were protecting in return for those people, the regular people in the society, uh, <clears throat> vowing pledges of allegiance, obedience. If they were called to do something, they had to do it. If they were called to fight, they had to fight. But primarily they could run into the castle. There often was a castle there and, and receive the Lord's protection when there was an invasion or others attacking. And then the king on his, on his steed and other nobles, with the knights and so on, uh, with their lances and swords, would, would be there to help defend the castle and the people. So, have you completely, totally surrendered to your Lord? We don't even use the word Lord, so I'm going to talk about that as we go along. Um, I have another sermon on the audio website. Is Yeshua Lord of your life? Or something like that's the title. I'm hitting different points in this sermon. This is new, new, new points. But you may want to go back and hear that one as well. So where's the starting point? As I prepare this today in 2021, to me the starting point after God's called us is brokenness. Total and absolute brokenness. Our point of authentic, total surrender must be when we come to God. Total brokenness. We've had enough of ourselves. We're shocked at what we've just been or just done. Like Peter came to that point of brokenness when Yeshua looked at him after he denied him the third time. It says Peter went and departed and just wept. He wept and wept. Now repentance is more than just weeping. Repentance is more than just crying about your sorrow. Repentance means turning around, going the other way. It starts, though, with a real brokenness. And I think of us being like a wild horse, a young horse that's never had a saddle put on it, never had anything on its back. And it has to be broke or broken before someone can safely ride on it. So a broken horse is a horse that can be safely ridden by others. The horse has to learn new rules that has to accept the cinch and the, the saddle and the reins and the bit in the mouth and all of those things, which at first it doesn't want to have anything to do with. 
doesn't want to have a rider on his back. He doesn't want to have that rider telling him, go here, go there. He's not used to that, how fast it should go, when to turn. But a well-trained, broken horse, it's kind of like us when we're finally broken to God. It's broken its own, its own spirit and personality. It still has its own spirit. Don't get me wrong. It has a, a broken horse. Is, is, is that, it becomes actually a very happy horse. It has its own personality. They definitely have personalities. But when it's master and rider and the horse are in tune and the horse has been broken correctly, they move as one. The slightest signal from the rider and the horse knows to go faster, slower, stop, turn, whatever, turn around. You don't see a well-broken horse. You don't see the rider yanking the, uh, the reins. It's just barely, barely movement there. And, and the horse is basically saying, not my will, but yours be done. I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm feeling for everything. Yeshua did that when he prayed to his father in John 17. Now, he talked about that. That, that prayer in John 17 was probably in Gethsemane. I pray that they may be one as we are one. I pray that they may be one in us. I've got to paraphrase John 17, 21 a bit there. That they may be one in us. It's only by us being in God and God being in us that we can all be one with one another and with God. But unlike a uh, trained and broken horse, we too often are not in tune. We too often are resisting the will of our father, our rider, our, our, our leader. I'm using the analogy of a rider, the master, the Lord. We, we, we don't even often seek it. We're not even aware that he's telling us what he wants us to do today and this week and this month and the rest of our life. We don't even, we, many of us, if we're honest, don't even know for sure what the Father's will is for us, what Yeshua's will is for us. If I ask you, what is Yeshua's will for you today? What's his will for you tomorrow, this week, this month? Most of us would love to have sermons on how to determine the will of God because, let's be honest, I have often myself wondered, what is God's will for the rest of my life? Does God want me to do light on the rock? Does he not? Does God want me to continue working where I work? Does he want me to retire? These are all questions, and I seek his mind, seek his will. Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. You don't desire sacrifice, or else I'd give it, but you do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken spirit. It doesn't mean we stay down. It doesn't mean we're depressed. It just means our own wild spirit. It means our own uncontrollable, like a wild horse. That's broken. Now it will take a saddle. It still has its personality and its life, but now it's subservient. We're not totally surrendered yet. In other words, if we aren't in tune with what the master wants, if our spirit is fighting his, if we're not seeking to obey him. Isaiah 66, verse 2, the last part of the verse. Isaiah 66, verse 2. On this one I will look, on him who is of a poor and a contrite, humble, repentant, okay, of a poor and a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Please, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, let's get back to that. Trembling at God's word, completely seeking his will. And yet we love him. We're not afraid in, in, in terror anymore because love casts out terror and fear of the wrong kind. We should ask God to help us surrender to his will. When you ask that prayer, though, ask him to do it gently because <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we need a real whack. But to look... We want to look for his guidance and surrender. A soul whose stubbornness has been broken will apply that bro brokenness and be seeking direction in every single aspect of our lives. I hope you understand that. Now, num number one, brokenness. Completely surrender your spirit. Completely surrender what you want to do to him. Number two, then once you're in brokenness, we cry out to God on our knees and we call out, and 
I, I am trying to say this every day now. My Lord, my God, I proclaim you. I proclaim you as my Lord and master of my life. I proclaim it. I totally surrender to you. Please help me to continually surrender to you, to come to you without reservation, holding nothing back. And where I have held anything back, show me that. I want to surrender all my habits, all my bad habits to you, all my sins, anything that's keeping me from fully exhibiting your life in me. You, my Lord Yeshua, you are my captain, my life, my joy, and my God. I haven't always said that all my life. I've said it here and there throughout my life. I'm trying to do it almost every day, not, not that it becomes rote, but say it in different words. You are my Lord. You are my commander. You are my king. Because again, in the Greek, it meant commander. It meant ruler. It meant Lord. It meant master, sir, leader, the one I'm sub submitting to. In John 20, be turning over there in John 20, verses 27 and 28, we all have to come to that point of having that face-to-face -face, uh, personal meeting with Yeshua, the King of Kings. Rem remember when Thomas said in John 20, around verse 24, 25, he said, unless I put my fingers in the prints of the nails on his hands, unless I see that and feel it, unless I can put my whole hand, he says, into his side. I saw when the soldier put that spear in his side, and everything came out. I saw that. There's a hole in his side. I want to see. I can put my hand in there. Where Yeshua later on appeared, and Thomas was there this time. And he says in verse 27, Reach your finger here, Thomas. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into, into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And that's part of brokenness, is that we're going to start saying, I believe you. I'm, I'm broken from my stubborn unbelief. I'm broken from my worrying. I'm broken from my wondering what you're doing all the time and being afraid of what I've heard has happened to my child or my husband or my wife or work or losing a job. Worrying. Worrying means you don't believe. Worrying means you've given up belief. Let's call a spade a spade. Worrying has to stop. Yeshua said at the end of Matthew, what is it, 5, don't worry. Don't worry. Because that's what Gentiles, that's what unbelievers do. And Thomas said to him, oh, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Yeshua is also God. Go back in Hebrews 1, verses 6, 7, 8, and there it, it talks about how God even commanded the angels to worship him as their God. And he is the Word, and the Word is God and was God. John 1. So we, like Thomas, must come to such a personal point in our lives where we just, we humble ourselves and we just surrender to him. Frankly, most of the Bible leaders had to have that kind of moment with God. Moses in the burning bush, and God had to say, Who made mouth, Moses? What do you mean you can't speak? I'll be with you. Come on, believe in me. I mean, they all had those moments where they, Paul certainly did, on the road to Damascus. And one by one, they all did. So I'll expand this in, in, in uh, part two. The message of total surrender has to mean, has to mean, has to mean that we always, you always, if you're totally believing him as your Lord, You've given up control of your life to him. That you trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him some more. No matter what he's making us go through, as bad as it seems sometimes, as horrible and no answer possible as it seems sometimes. We've come to the Red Sea, the army behind us, the mountains to the side, the Red Sea in front of us. The chariots are ready to charge. We have to trust, trust, trust. That's why those stories are there, even when it looks impossible. Even Yeshua, it says, was perfected, was made complete, was made whole by the things which he suffered. Okay? So we come to the point in this trust as our Lord that we proclaimed him. Now, point number two, proclaim him as Lord and everything that means. 
we come to that point where we say, thank you in this trial. Peter talks about though these trials and these hard times that, that are more precious than gold that perishes. More precious than gold. If God said to you, I can make you have some terrible trials that will bring you to closer to perfection, closer to the wholeness and, and, and the perfect stature, the fullness and wholeness of Christ, or I'll give you five bars of gold. If we weren't idiots, we'd say, give me the trials. Too many times, though, we're idiots. We don't understand that we should be thanking God, as Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 say, thanking him in all things with thanksgiving, presenting our request to God with thanksgiving. Ephesians 5, 20 and others say, thanking him for all things. Rejoice in your trials. When you're in trials, count it all joy. I mean, all these verses in the Bible, do they mean something to us or not? But Yeshua himself is going to be the Lord of the whole earth. We might as well start with that right now, that we trust you, Lord Jesus. We trust you, Yeshua, my king, my high priest, my friend and my brother, my Lord. Say it. Philippians 2, verses 8 to 11, it says, Being found in appearance of a man, he, Yeshua, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, of Yeshua, Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that by every tongue, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. Every tongue should confess. Let's you and me do that now, that Jesus, Yeshua, is Lord. We say it now. We say it to each other. We say it in our prayers. To the glory of God the Father. Have you and I ever had our tongues recently in the last week confess that Jesus or Yeshua is Lord? Don't be shy about it. Paul, was, Paul sure wasn't. He talked about Yeshua being Lord to the Roman soldiers he was chained to. He taught there's one God, the Father, and one Lord through whom we live, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and the only one who will not have to bow to Yeshua. We read about that in Philippians 8, no, not Philippians 8, Philippians 2, verse 8 to 10. The only one who won't have to bow down is God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that everything comes under Yeshua except God the Father. He is God most high. Remember that the head of woman is man, or the wife is man, uh, the head of the husband is Christ, and the, red, the head of Christ is God the Father. Now Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. A lot of, a lot of certain Sabbath-keeping groups don't often read this because it's kind of a protestant verse. It's not. It's in the Bible. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth the Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So in my prayers, I try to many times a week just say, Father in heaven, I know that you resurrected my Lord Yeshua. I know that he's there and alive. I know the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. And praise you, my Lord Yeshua. Say it. Confess with your mouth. Say it. Like I read in Philippians 2, verse 10 or so, that every tongue will confess that Yeshua is Lord. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Some of you might be wondering why I'm saying Yeshua instead of Lord or Jesus. I mean, the name, the vocalization, the audio, the sound, the hearing of the, of the words, Jesus. No one even spoke it that way for hundreds of years after Christ. And there's no J, by the way, in Hebrew. So even what we call Jerusalem, in English we have J. Over there it's Yerushalayim. It's a Y, well, Yerushalayim. And the Hebrew name for Jesus that his mama called him was Yeshua, meaning Savior. Okay, I have no problem with saying Jesus because that's who you all identify with and I identify with too. But I go by the name his mama called him. My mama called me Philip. Okay, so if I'm in Spain... I might say, uh, what's my name? I might say Felipe. That's what it is in Spanish. But my mama called me Philip. And almost always they'll say, well, then we call you Philip. You understand what I'm saying? 
We say Mikhail Gorbachev. We never said Michael or Mikey Gorbachev, right? Right? Giuseppe Verdi, the composer and piano player, pianist, a musician. Giuseppe Verdi means uh, uh, Joseph Green, Joe Green. Well, we, we never say, now the next piece will be done by Joe Green. No, we say Giuseppe Verdi, the real name. So that's why I say Yeshua. I don't mind saying Jesus. I don't think that's a sin. But I'm just saying so you understand. That's the name Mama gave him. That the angels gave Mama to give him. Acknowledge your Savior out loud with your own voice that he is your Lord. He is your master. Say it. Say it. Because a lot of groups out there, especially Sabbath-keeping groups, are not in the habit of using even using the word Lord. Some do. But in reference to Christ, they might say Christ, which means anointed, same as Messiah, which means anointed in Hebrew, Mashiach, okay, Messiah. So let's start using this word. If you prefer master, that's fine, use it. Kurios in the Greek, sir, lord, ruler, owner, master, leader. Sometimes we just use his name, Jesus. Most of the time in, in talking, uh, to him about him, they would say Lord Jesus or Lord Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, but not just Jesus. But there are dozens of places where the word just plain Jesus is used as well. But over 100 Testament verses use the term Lord Jesus and not just Jesus. You see, in our society, what I'm trying to say here, this point, I'm trying to get you to start using that if you don't. Many of you have Protestant persuasion persuasion already use it, but the Sabbath-keeping ones often don't. In the Philippines, if you had an older brother, you didn't just call him by his name. You would say Manong, which meant older brother, respectfully. Manang, if it's older sister. And Ading, if it's younger child or younger brother. Ading, younger child. Apo, if it was an older man. Uh, apo literally is the word they use when they translate the word Lord in the Bible. Lord. Okay, many people are called Lord, but there is one Lord overall, and that's Yeshua. So we've gotten away from these respectful terms that we normally should have. So, for example, here in the South, it's still not uncommon unless you talk to people who've come in from the North. But for people born and raised in the South, it's not at all uncommon that they will talk to you and say, Yes, sir or no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. And it's because they were taught that when you're talking to somebody, especially someone in authority or someone older, you say sir, and you say ma'am. In fact, you're taught that if you're talking to anybody, you say sir, you say ma'am. Just like you'll find Abraham and other people in the Bible often use the word Lord in talking to the leaders and, 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 and people from, from the society around them. Yes, my Lord, okay? Let's get in the habit of calling him Lord. That's point number two. Point number one is brokenness. Point number two, because we're broken, he is our Lord. If I keep looking to the sides because I'm looking at the camera, I should look, I mean, I'm looking at the screen instead of the camera. I recommend you get in the practice of consciously saying out loud several times a day, daily in prayer, even whispered as you walk along, King Yeshua, you are my Lord, raised from the dead by God the Father to, your, to his glory. You are my Savior. You're my Redeemer, my God, my Commander. I need you. I need you showing me the way. I need to submit to you. Help me surrender to you. Show me your will. Help me obey your will. And help me seek your will like a wild horse that's been broken, now riding as one unit. The horse and rider become as one. I want to be like that with you, as one, as you and Father are one. I recommend you set a time to fast. And repent of Laodiceanism. Repent of lukewarmness. Repent of your seeking your own will. And we're going to get in part two into some pretty hairy things about what it means to really be surrendered. Acts 9, verses 3 to 6. Let's read that. Have your face-to-face -face moment with him. We've all, we're, we're all going to have it. You'll, you'll find a time, a moment in your life when you're finally broken. You finally... It might be years after you thought you were broken, after years after you were baptized. We'll all need this moment, the Damascus moment, okay? The Thomas moment, the, the burning bush moment, all of those. The Red Sea moments, all of those. Acts 9, verses 3 to 6. As he journeyed, Paul now, 
um, came near to Damascus. And I'm using the New King James here because I'm using New King James here because, believe it or not, most of the newer translations leave out half of verse 5 and the first half of verse 6. Leave it out. So I really like the New King James because it's much more authentic to the original. They use a different set of, uh, of original manuscripts. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly a light shone around him in heaven, from heaven. And Paul fell to the ground, Saul here is his name, and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, who are you, Lord? Even at this point, he realized someone powerful, and he's going to call him Lord at this point. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. I am Yeshua, whom you're persecuting. Now the next 20 words or so are not in the modern translations. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. I've been goading you. I've been trying to get your attention, Paul. And you keep kicking back at me. You're not being responsive at all. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The part left out of the modern translations in verse 6, so he, trembling and astonished, him who trembled at my word. He just heard the word of God. Yeshua is the word of God. Now he's trembling. He's astonished. What on earth is going on? Lord! Would you have said Lord? Master? We Americans got to get to that point where we're having these respectful terms. Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Paul wasn't, told, wasn't used to being told what to do. He was used to, if you read the beginning of chapter 9, going to the leaders and telling them what he wanted to do. I want to go to Damascus. I want to bring men and women bound tightly back here who are proclaiming this Jesus thing. So he was used to telling other people what to do. And now he's blinded, and, and Yeshua says, I'm going to have someone tell you what to do. Get to the city. Obey. I'm now your Lord, you see. So through that question, though it's left out in most tri Bible translations, what do you wish me to do? That is crucial. Set a day of fasting. Set a day of seeking him. Saying, my Lord, what is it you wish me to do going forward with the rest of my life? And where have I not fully surrendered to you? Would you please show me? Where do I need to submit to you? And then listen quietly. The answer may come right away, even while you're kneeling in prayer. Especially if your face is on the ground. It may come to you very quickly. It may come to you hours later. It may come to you a few days later. But if you seek him, you'll surely find him. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. Ask. Ask. The actual order is ask, seek, and knock. A-S-K. All right. Ask and it will be answered. Seek, and you'll, it'll be found. So, so seek, seek is lead, leadership. Full surrender includes this. Very, very important. Our lives are no longer our own. No longer what we hope to accomplish. Our goals should no longer be our goals. James even says, you who say, we'll go to this city and that city for a year, and then he says, foolish people, you don't even know how quickly your life can change. You know, a sudden buzzing in our pocket a cell phone going off can change our life instantly with whatever the news is. So we, we should say whatever the Lord wills. That's in James chapter 4. Whatever, it's not in my notes, but James chapter 4 somewhere near the end. Whatever the Lord wills, that's what I'm going to seek. It's all about seeking our master's will, just as Yeshua sought to do the will of his father. Remember in Gethsemane, Father, is there some other way? Do I have to do this? Crucifixion, have we missed something that's possible? But not my will, not what I want. Our lives no longer are what I want or what you want. You want to go to Cancun? You want to get on a cruise? You want to stop a start a business, stop a business? It's not what you want unless you've sought God's will and the door's been opened and he's, you feel clearly you're walking in his leadership. 
before you look for work or accept a job, before you decide to buy or sell a home, before you decide to propose or not to a beautiful woman or a wonderful man of your dreams. A surrendered life will always first go to God, to Yeshua, and say, My Lord, I'm attracted to this person. I'd like to marry her. Now, I am married right now, so I, I'm just kidding. Obviously, God's going to say, Hey, no, you married someone else. You can't divorce and remarry like that that easily. Seek his will. Look for it. Ask him to close doors. When I pray like that, I say, please open doors you want me to go through and please slam shut, lock tight doors you don't want me wasting my time going in that direction. And then when I come to a locked tight door that I really thought I wanted to go through, instead of feeling badly, instead of wondering why I can't go through there, I raise, when I'm obedient, I'm not always obedient, but when I'm obedient, I raise my hands to God and praise him. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Yeshua, for locking that door I thought you wanted me to go through before, but now I see you don't. Even in Bible study, begin each Bible study with a surrender to him, with a brokenness that I don't know how to come in, I don't know how to go out. I don't know your word very well. Please give me understanding. Open your word to my mind. Let the Holy Spirit show me what you really want to talk to me about. And we're no longer slaves to sin. Open my eyes to see you in my word. Okay? Even I tell him, I want so badly to know what I'm, uh, that I am beginning to know you. I'd like so much to have you show me that you're bringing me to that part. This is what Jesus was, Yeshua was saying in John 5, verses 35 to 40. John 5, verses 37 to 40. As the Father himself who sent me has testified of me, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. He's talking to the Pharisees and people like that. Um, but no one's seen God. Some have heard his voice, though, but no one's seen God, the Father. But you do not have his word abiding in you, abiding in you, because whom he sent you don't believe. You search the scriptures. You're real good at knowing what the original Hebrew, Greek, and whatever means. You're real good at the context. You're real good at memorizing all of it. You search the scriptures. You've got all your charts. For in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. You're missing the point, he's saying. Verse 40, John 5, 40. When you start your Bible study, I like to start with this. Yeshua, I want to come to you as I open my Bible every morning. I want to come to you. I want to surrender to you. I want to find you in this word. Please open my heart, open my eyes, open my ears to hear you. Open my eyes to see you. Okay, you haven't come to me, verse 40, that you may have life. To perfectly do your master's will, you have to count all things beforehand as loss. Paul did in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. He talks about the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I've suffered the loss of everything. Peter said that too. We've given up everything to follow you. Paul's saying it here. I've suffered the loss of everything. My respect among the Jewish leaders, I was going to become the next Gamaliel. I had wealth. I had money. I had honor. But now I'm in chains. That's fine. The loss of all things, I consider them rubbish or dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's what I want to be. I want to be in him. Not having my own righteousness from the law, from my own efforts. I don't want to be righteous by the best I can do. I want to be righteous the best God is. He says, I don't want my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Which is from God by faith. When Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 1. That I'm, or six or something, it's Genesis 15 anyway, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. That's my whole life. And he ends up in a fellowship of his sufferings. I want, I want the sufferings because that will perfect me, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. We can find ourselves 
working so hard for God that we forget God. You get up and you go, go to church services where you have where you can without this COVID thing, and you spend all the time getting the, the hall set up and all of that, and then you clean up afterwards and you set up the coffee clutch and all that, and forget God. Maybe the day goes by you never even prayed. My dad cautioned me. He was visiting me one time when I was, I think I was preparing for a canoe trip for the youth of the church, the teenagers. And he saw how I was so busy getting that done, making phone calls, arranging, make sure the canoes were there, make sure everybody was knew where to be. He said, Philip, don't be serving God's people so hard that you forget God. Don't be so wrapped up working for our Lord Jesus, he said that you have no personal time for Jesus. Did you hear that? Don't be so busy working for others that you think is working for God and forgetting God. So my dad cautioned me. So none of this will happen if we don't start this surrender, this seeking of him, this knowing him. If any of you still start a day or go through a morning without prayer, without God's word, which is our daily bread. And when did they have to pick the manna? Early in the morning before it got hot. And Yeshua says, I'm that bread from heaven. And I have to remind myself to go back to basics. Green Bay Packers coach Vince Lombardi, they were champs, NFL champs, several years in a row. He would start the next season holding a football. And he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would start with the basics. Because when you forget the basics, the very foundation erodes and you fall apart. The basics of success is like God told Joshua. Look at my word. Meditate on my word day and night and you will have success. It's like Paul said, that I may know him. Like Yeshua taught us, seek first the kingdom, the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not when you find time for it later in the day. Seek first. Make it your goal that after you get up and go to the bathroom, you get on your knees right then and there. First, first, first. If you're putting other things before God, you have other gods. Other things more important than God. Seek first the kingdom of God. I was in a wonderful habit of doing that when I went to a Bible college in England between ages 18 and 21. Then I went to uh, the States for the final year. But um, we all would get up. When I first got there, when I woke up in the morning in time to get, get, get dressed real fast to go to our, our first class, I wonder where, where everybody was. There was nobody there except me and the other freshmen. And so I got up, and they, they were all at their desk, already showered, already dressed, Bibles open. And I learned, yes, you seek God first. Pray, get up, pray, take your shower, get dressed, do your Bible study. Then you go eat regular food. Those were basics that we, go, we got away from, I think. Must fill our mind with him, make daily prayer a habit. We're totally surrendered. So I'll leave the rest for, uh, till, till part two of the sermon. So just as America could not accept Japan's surrender unless it was unconditional, God's not accepting yours or mine too unless it's un un unconditional. America was very kind to Japan. You'll find that Yeshua and God the Father are so kind to us when we completely surrender them. You won't believe what he's got in store for us. Even now in this life, in many, many cases, let alone in the life to come. So we come with our brokenness to God and we come and we acknowledge him and speak it out. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Talk to me. Show me your way. We'll finish this next time with lots more points. Lots more points. Uh, like finding God's will, bringing every thought into captivity. How do we do that? And being part of a new kingdom, not Satan's kingdom. And so much more I'll have to cover next time. Father in heaven, we close now. We just ask you, to bless and give your divine blessing on all those who are listening. 
put your divine protection around them, around the COVID virus that's going around. Just stop it from affecting any more of your people. Just stop it. In Yeshua's name, we condemn it. We put your walls of protection around your people. Give them the faith that they need. Let them know that everything that happens to them, even COVID, if you allow it to happen, it's in your will. You will work things out, even all the way to death, through death. We trust, trust, trust you. You are our king. You are our master. Let us finally learn that and be at least like a well-broken horse, riding as one with the master, without having to be beaten or anything, but just with slight signals. It knows to turn, go faster, stop, to turn around. Let us be at least that responsive to you. We thank you and we praise you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Put your guardian angels around us. Bless those who are, who are obeying you and seeking you. Bless them, bless them, bless them. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.